I'm Hannes. I'm the Lightning Talks moderator. I want to keep it uh, short. Um, I've gotten several PDFs on a USB stick. There are people who want to present with their own laptops. They are scheduled at the end or to the end because I don't like to replug everything because we are short on time. So we'll start with the list um, of the talks. Um, I will simply go through as uh, noted in the wiki, and if someone is around who wants to present that talk, he just comes uh, in front. Okay, so we, sh so we start with the uh, plagiarism detection. Is she around, Deborah Viber Wolf? No? Then the Vidalia project. Jeff, do you need anything? No, you have to. Can you use that one if you want? Okay. Hi, my name is Matt Edman. I'm the developer and project leader of sorts for the Vidalia project. If you were at Roger's tour talk yesterday, you may have heard him mention Vidalia a couple times. Um, sure. Can everybody hear me now? Okay. All right. So uh, if you've never heard of Vidalia before, um, it's uh, an effort to build a cross-platform, nice, usable GUI for Tor. Um, it's written in C++ using Qt4. Uh, if you've downloaded Tor from the website using one, uh, the Win32 or the OSX bundles, you probably already have Vidalia. Um, for those who haven't, uh, I'm just going to run through some screenshots real quick. Um, Vidalia is meant to be small, un uh, unobtrusive. It, for the most part, just lives in your system tray as a little icon. You right-click on the icon, you get some more options. Uh, if you double-click on the icon, you get bigger buttons um, with some of the things people usually click on and uh, buttons we really want you to click on, like the Setup Relaying button. There's also a network map, so you can see an approximate geographic distribution of the Tor network and the, the path that your traffic takes as it, it bounces around the network. Um, it's also, we try to make it easier to configure your Tor, particularly as a relay. Um, so if you want to set up a, a normal relay or a bridge, uh, hopefully that's not too much trouble. Uh, we also have a message log so you can see what your Tor is doing um, without having to go out and find a file in your file system and cat it or something like that. And then some built-in help documentation for most of its features. But what I really want to talk about is the things that I want to do within the next year um, and some things that I could really use some help doing. Uh, for one of them, you probably noticed that the network map isn't terribly aesthetically pleasing. It's kind of grainy if you zoom in. Uh, the points aren't clickable and the circuits aren't clickable. Uh, so we want to make that a little bit better. One of the options is KDE's marble widget. Um, it probably needs some hacking to be useful for us, but uh, I put together a quick little proof of concept, and it, uh, that's what it looks like. Um, so it looks a lot nicer. The, the points are actually clickable, but we still need to hack on marble a little bit to... Uh, like make the circuits clickable, um, and it's still kind of slow. Uh, some other things, if you were at Roger's talk, you heard him mention UPnP support. Um, it would be really nice if when people want to set up relays, if we can uh, help them configure their NAT for port forwarding or whatever. Um, so maybe that will make it easier for people to set up their own relays. Uh, another thing is new versions of Tor come out quite a bit. I think there's been like four new versions in the last two weeks or something. So. It would be great if we could alert users when these new versions are available and offer to uh, download and install them for them. Um, Vidalia isn't released quite as frequently, but still want to do the same thing there. Uh, another thing are status events. Uh, a lot of times if something goes wrong with your Tor, a message just appears in your message log and you don't think to look there and you don't know something went wrong. Um, so it would be nice to build an interface for letting people know about these events um, in a way that doesn't really annoy them. Um, so maybe you hate writing code. Uh, that's fine. We need help from all sorts of people. Uh, if you're like hacking with Photoshop or GIMP or something, um, we could use some icons. Uh, right now, the icons in our system tray, they're not animated. They don't do anything. It would be nice to show some sort of action when the user's browsing so they know that uh, their traffic's actually being anonymized through Tor. Um, another thing we'd like to, is uh, a logo. We don't really have a logo of our own. We've just sort of been pilfering Tor's onion for a while, so 
it would be nice to have something better than that. Um, multilingual people. We have about 16 translations right now. Um, none of them are entirely complete, uh, and some of them are wrong. So like, I heard that our, our cookie authentication in Norwegian was actually translated as cake authentication. Um, so you know, even if there is a translation in your language, uh, it would be great if you could go through the existing stuff, improve it, find out what's wrong. Uh, there's some strings that are probably still in English, so if you could translate those, that would be great. Or start your own translation, that's fine too. Um, if you're an academic usability sort of person, we'd really like to uh, do a formal user study. Uh, the approach to implementing features we've taken so far is find out what people yell at me the most about and then implement that. Um, which is maybe not the best approach, but it's, I guess it's worked so far. Um, but if you would like to organize a, a formal usability study as uh, maybe as part of a, a class project for HCI people or something, I'd uh, love to be a part of that. Um, if you uh, like doing tech writing, um, our help documentation for the, the built-in help browser is fairly limited, so we could really use some help expanding that. Um, uh, and also translators, we need some help translating the, the help documentation. That's only in uh, three languages, I think. Um, and of course, we need everything that all of the, uh, every open source project needs, like some constructive feedback. Uh, if you want to say Vidalia's bloated crapware, that's fine. Um, but something more helpful would be, would be great. Uh, good bug reports, those are always useful. Something better than it doesn't work. Um, feature suggestions, uh, I'm sure you have ideas that I haven't listed up here and maybe aren't on our to-do, so if you want to let me know about those, uh, I'd be happy to hear about them. And of course, everybody can edit our wiki. If you tried to run Vidalia and you ran into some problems, uh, just add that to the wiki so other people can benefit. Um, if you're interested in any of this, we have a lot of development resources available. Our subversion repository is, of course, public. Uh, we have a wiki, bug tracker, stuff like that. Um, most of the development discussion goes on in our IRC channel, so feel free to stop by and talk to us there. Or you can email me, or I'll be around for the rest of the day. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. So the next is uh, Power Structure Research with Pell TCL on Battlesman, which is sadly cancelled. The preview was quite nice. Then the next would be console hacking, state of the VII is bashing and others around. Anyone? No one. Uh, free, free communication without data orientation. Rolf. Need anything? Browser? No. Huh? Okay. So I don't need. <laughs> yes, I don't need anything. I don't want to waste time with <laughs> some not functionality <laughs> uh, techniques. What I uh, want to tell you is, uh, I don't want to be the 171 first uh, who talks about. Uh, uh, data retention. We heard about lots in the last four days. Uh, what we heard is uh, we should have uh, go into resistance. That's the most important thing that we that we should do. And all you know that that's not my uh, my issue. The, ne uh, the next is we have a lot of technical possibilities to go around or to to get rid of it. It's I know it's only a, a workaround. Uh, we should, in the end, we should get rid of it uh, totally. But now the only thing we have is the techniques, using the techniques. We will do that. I, I, I'm sure that any one of you here and, and the other guys in, in this house will use the techniques we have, uh, just like a strong encryption or Tor or uh, OTR, or anything else we have uh, to don't give them our data. Uh, but that's just us, it's a few thousand people, but we are 81 million in, in Germany, and how to get the others? And that's what, what I uh, want to give you to think over. Uh, 
people, all of us, that's me too, uh, we, we are hunters and collectors. And uh, so my question was, why is payback functioning and why doesn't uh, PGP, is 10 years old, why, why doesn't anybody uses PGP? Okay, it's not the strongest encryption, I know that. But uh, uh, they don't do it. Why don't they do it? Uh, because they have to do additional things to get uh, the functionality they had before. So they won't do it. Um, I asked a friend of my, my daughter a few days before, why don't you do it? And the answer was, yes, you are right. That's not the answer on my question. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we have to do what payback does. We have to give them something to get them, to protect them from themselves. That is my message today. Uh, we have to think over uh, what can we do to give them uh, an additional um, benefit when they uh, use the techniques we have. Um, what I did uh, to, to collect the ideas you have, uh, I made today, I set up a new uh, a web page that is uh, um, volksvernetzung.de, not volksverhetzung, volksvernetzung, you know. Yeah? So I'm German and it's a German page, of course. Uh, it's set up a few hours uh, before. You may uh, go there and, and write in, it's a wiki, uh, write in your ideas. The first idea I had, and I talked to Padaloon and, and he said uh, with the Fulboot I can uh, make a, a one of those things uh, working is my, my cell phone. I have a contract uh, that is a flat rate into the fixed net in Germany. Uh, and I think lots of you have, and other people out there also. We will create a button uh, which says uh, free public phone. So if you find someone with this button, uh, you may change the cell phones not to get stolen, uh, so you have to to have to get something for it, and uh, call someone, your your friend, your your grandma, and <laughs> any anywhere else, and uh, if they uh, they track our data, the data retention will will be totally confused then, because anyone calls to anyone, and it is uh, that is my idea. What what I uh, d uh, talked with Padaloon and, and we will do with the Fulwood in the next weeks, I think uh, we will do something on that. Uh, so please think about ways to give the people out there some additional benefit uh, collecting points and give them when they have 10,000 points an inflatable ball. <laughs> it's, it's okay, they do it with payback also. So. Uh, they are hunters and collectors. Think about that and uh, help them to protect them from themselves. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, the next one is also cancelled. So, uh, Netzim is presented behind because he's using a known laptop. So, next would be Andre, useful automation, how to destroy fingerprints. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> Was your USB stick here? <laughs> so, do we have any presenter who's on the list and don't need any slides? Or okay. Yeah, I can do it without. I mean. Okay. Then do it. 
Well, I'm really sorry. Uh, it wasn't intended to do that. <laughs> so uh, you could see maybe if it were working that I said, how to destroy your fingerprints, question mark. Because um, there is no easy way right now. Um, uh, but we need to find a way to do that. So I tell you a little bit about how I came to that topic. So you know, in Germany, we have to do the fingerprints into our passport now and uh, we can fake them and we also, yeah, but, but this doesn't help because then in the end, uh, when you come to a pass station, if you go through, they will just see that it is not yours and you will undergo even more uh, control and that is not what we want. What we want is, we want to say to them, you don't get our fingerprints. And uh, we want to do that because we can do it. There is no law saying that we have to give them our fingerprints. Even if we don't do it, we don't have to pay anything or anything. They just don't get our fingerprints and we get one without. So, And um, uh, this is why we, we want to do that. It was, it, it was really, it was just a FED 32. I didn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, and... Oh, okay. Uh, so, and uh, we, I, I looked a little bit on the net what uh, possibilities are there. And basically, you can burn down uh, the, the upper skin of your fingers, and it really hurts, so... Uh, or you can take formic acid, in German that's Ameisensäure, and uh, apply it to it, and then the skin, uh, you can peel it away. But that also hurts its acid. And th the next way uh, is that, I don't know it in English, this was a word I couldn't find, you can uh, abschleifen, abfeilen. To sand it away, okay. <laughs> and this also really hurts, and it's bloody and messy. And, uh, <laughs> You don't want to do that, and we are looking for, and I'm looking for an easy way to do that, and uh, this is why I, I want to give this talk, because I need ideas, and uh, I want to have your feedback. What can we do? We, uh, what we will try in the next couple of weeks, we will try to do that step by step, so formic acid is also in some medical patches that you can loosen some strong, if you have really strong skin, you can loosen that up, and maybe then send it away. So we will try a little bit of that, but uh, nothing of that is easy, and we want uh, somewhat your ideas to that. So you can email me, and this is what I needed the slide for. It's fingerprints at Andre, with a J in the end, Schulke, S-C-H-O-E-K-E, -E. just, I write it down here, right? <laughs> can I just write my email yeah, there? Yeah, sure. Um. It's also, in, it's also in the wiki, and we need everybody, so if you have an idea, mail it. If you want to help us by being a test subject, <laughs> mail me. If you know a skin doctor, I, I really uh, want to talk to some skin doctors, because it's not only about getting it away, but also to stop it from regrowing that fast, because if you, put, if you get it away, if you find an easy way, it's only a way for two days or so, and maybe you want it longer. And so I look, I look also for some advice from skin doctors and so on. So everybody, just write me a mail if you have an idea. That's basically all. Transplantation. Transplantation, oh yes, um, thank you, that was good. So uh, we found out that yeah, we can um, fake the, the fingerprints. Uh, we all saw that on video. And with the Formic ASIC patch uh, you, you get from the pharmacy, you can basically peel the real skin away and put the uh, fake fingerprint on it and it's ind indistinguishable. Even when you look closely, you cannot see that you have something else in there. That's uh, some interesting we found, uh, something interesting we found out. And also, um, when you were not in the biometric talk uh, yesterday, you can use a uh, soldering iron to 
paint funny pictures on your fingerprints. So. <laughs> but that's, that really hurts, so don't do that. <laughs> okay, so if you have idea how to do that, if you had problems with your fingerprints, wanted to get them away, just please write me. I, we need a lot of ideas to, do, to find something really easy to get rid of them. That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the next would be Dirk Krzyzynowski of uh, on topic city top level domains as basis of urban identity. Okay. You gave me his slides? Yeah. Yeah, hello. My, my name is Dirk Krzyzynowski and I'm founder uh, of the Dot Berlin initiative for a top-level domain for the uh, Berlin community. I hope the slides yeah, they're popping up. Uh, opening one day. Yeah, and as uh, the last two years, um, I'm uh, trying to inform you about what's going on with uh, top-level domain names, especially city top-level domain names, and what's what's going a little bit on at uh, ICANN, who will issue these new top-level domain names. Um, as you know, these top-level domain names are uh, basis of, of uh, our, uh, and the domain names are basis of our communications. Uh, if, you, if you use them for email, for websites, and uh, even for OpenID, uh, you need uh, top-level domains or you, at least URLs. And so that's what I'm going to talk about um, today. As you can see, there are, meanwhile, um, in change uh, to last year's presentation, top-level domain name in initiatives not only for Berlin, but also for Hamburg, for Paris, and for NYC, that's New York City. And there are a lot of uh, other initiatives for, for regional top-level domain names. Uh, the Scots want to have one, uh, the, the Basques want to have one, the Galicians, uh, the Bretons, and uh, several um, cultural and regional communities want to have their own top-level domain names and already founded uh, initiatives and will apply at uh, the next possibility at ICANN. <laughs> the, the timeline for these top-level domain names, when will they be available, is um, ICANN, uh, as you know, is, is uh, having application windows where you can file um, a top-level domain application, and the next window for filing such an application will be probably end of 2008, so in the fourth quarter, and it's expected that beginning of 2009, these uh, new top-level domain names uh, will be available. But um, beside, beside that, where is it? Beside um, uh, the city top-level domain names, there will come a lot of other top-level domain names. As you, as you can expect, uh, .shop, .web, .arc, or archive, or .library, or something like this. Uh, we will see top-level domain names uh, like .ibm or .mac or .apple even, or um, for social communities uh, like, like MySpace, uh, Facebook, uh, even Google is thinking about having its own top-level domain name for their customers. Um, we will see top-level domains like .bank, uh, inter-bank uh, exchange, or .iban or .giro, so making... Uh, uh, financial tra transaction more more uh, reliable, and we will see surname uh, top level domain names. So imagine all the three million people in the U.S. having uh, Smith as as last name, and they can have a own namespace. So that's uh, what I give uh, want to give as uh, update from from Icon and the top level domain namespace. There was a question there. Uh, how about dot or dot <laughs> No. <laughs> So that will probably not happen because ICANN has you know, new ru rules on top-level domain name approval and any top-level domain name which is against morality or public order will not be approved by ICANN. That's, 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 a, that's a U U.S. Uh, Department of uh, um, Commerce and uh, Defense which... Uh, more or less controlling the internet in a top-level domain name space, and uh, that's, that's their idea how the namespace should uh, look like. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, the next would be Marcel on the Human Future Optimization Project International. Um, test, test. So, um, where do you put this thing and will it crash the computer again? Well, we will see. No crash. <laughs> so um, this is uh, my first talk, and um, I'm a bit nervous, but um, we should be able to overcome that. No, um, how do you use this stuff? <laughs> Yeah, this. All right. So my talk is um, not actually about the um, thing itself, but um, about um, good reasons to do a world revolution. So, yeah. Um, can you do it full screen? I don't think so. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cheers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we have this. Yeah. All right. Whatever. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, so. Um, uh, world revolution is like you all know this uh, term like um, demolish the system and make a new system, which is quite uh, a thing people do not like because uh, change is something that scares people, so world revolution is not something that scares them less so um, but actually um, i think it's it's it 's a good thing to do to um, do a clean slate implementation of a world governance system. And so we set up the Thank Human you. Future Optimization Project International. The funky name, it's because it has Pi in its name and it's Pi in the logo and so uh, it fits. So, um, yeah, um, let me explain this was a metaphor. Like, um, you all know uh, Windows XP. It's not that bad, but it's not quite that good. So. Um, Let's, uh, for a second, uh, use this analogy. So um, our perspective, we as uh, mankind, we are Microsoft. And um, the time is um, 2007. Right now um, equals uh, 2002. This is the time when uh, Microsoft uh, released Windows XP uh, Service Pack 1 which is something that works most of the time, but um, yeah, it has some issues. And um, yeah, the product is uh, democracy and free market economy, or current uh, political system, uh, which is uh, compared to Windows XP, SP1. It's, it's not bad, it works, like for most of us, so we can get our beer and we can watch TV and stuff, but there's, there's a lot of uh, problems with it. And um, yeah, the um, the situation was no. Um, oh shit! Damn it! Um, in 2002, when they released this, they um, they had two options to go. Like um, they had this quite building operating system with problems, and one way to remove the problems is by doing a fresh start, Windows proper. They, um, they have uh, quite an extensive uh, research uh, laboratory, so they, um, they are working on the singularity kernel, which is some sort of micro kernel, and it's clean implemented, and it's quite, seems quite sane. And yeah, Windows could use a clean and sane RP. Anyone who has used the Win32 RP, it's, it's a mess, and yeah, this win file, win file system, 
uh, they promised for uh, Windows XP, and the Monad shell, which is actually implemented in uh, uh, Vista. Vista. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, they would have to to break binary binary compatibility for that. So uh, that was one option, and the other one was, of course, to do Windows Vista and to not get into legal trouble, the trademarks. And uh, Windows Proper, they don't have a trademark, they didn't do it. And um, yeah, no, their decision was to, to do uh, Windows Vista. So after being postponed several times, Microsoft released Windows Vista to the wild on 13th January of 2007 with several promised features cut because they could not get them to work. This is like, they had themselves problems um, implementing this stuff so it worked and uh, works and uh, is, is stable. So they just couldn't finish and um, they, they left it out. So um, the product, it's like if you compare Windows XP to Windows Vista, um, it's not like such a big advantage and it doesn't fix many of the real problems. So um, yeah, to uh, play our analogy, so we as uh, a civilization of uh, human beings. Our current political system is democracy and free market economy uh, in most states, and uh, many consider this to be the best of all uh, available alternatives. And so um, our, our options right now are, um, question mark, what um, evolves from the current state, like capitalism, plus some years, um, all this, um, yeah, democrat democratization uh, movement. The U.S. has started successfully in Iraq and stuff. And, um, yeah, kind of like that, you know what I mean. And the other one is to make a fresh start and, um, yeah, do things from, from the blank sheet. And, um, yeah, our decision is not yet made. And, um, which is good, because we can still do it. And um, the reasons, um, I think a fresh start um, would be preferable is to, um, uh, is about freedom to, um, t um, for the design of, of, um, of your new, new um, uh, society or, yeah, society governance system. Um, you have many of the constraints. Um, uh, if, you, if you work with a product you have and you just um, are able to improve upon it, you have to, yeah, many things you can't just change them. You can only change, make small changes bit by bit and, and stuff. You can't just, um, um, you can't change the structure because, yeah, it's, it's um, you can't do it. With, you can't change the structure with, uh, without doing a fresh start. So many of the constraints, if you do um, uh, try to do it from scratch, are gone, except loss of nature, and yeah, probably uh, law, Murphy's Law. And um, yeah, it, it gives you a chance to do um, a topology which is uh, target directed, like you want to achieve something, like make humans happy and uh, improve upon everything and save the environment and increase efficiency and all this stuff. And so um, if you have a blank sheet, you can, you can, you can think of um, a structure, ways uh, to, to achieve this without being bound to the, to the current implementation of our system, which is, uh, yeah, Windows XP like. And um, you know, efficiency is defined as what you get out from something um, divided by uh, or per what you what you uh, need to do for it. So uh, there's a lot of way. Uh, there are many ways to to uh, to um, to target efficiency if you if you do it from scratch. Um, you can learn from exp experience and. Um, avoid uh, the silly mistakes you have made uh, the first time. So there are many problems in, in our current um, political system and um, we could just uh, design them away and um, yeah, let them not 
uh, develop in the first place. And last but not least, if you depreciate the, the craft, so the, all the leftover stuff, you don't have to fix the old bugs. So um, you just, um, all the problems of the old system, by doing a new implementation, you can just push them away, out of sight, they're gone. You can concentrate on, on your new start and make that polished, make it proper, make it clean, and make it work. So that's about it. At the end, thank you for listening. Um, and um, I've set up a poll at this uh, website where you can, um, like not everyone is probably uh, the same opinion uh, that we should do something like world revolution or stuff, and, uh, or that it's even possible or we need it and stuff. And yeah, it would be cool if you would voice your opinion on that. And yeah, last but not least, hack the planet. <laughs> I cheer. Thanks, dann USB Stick. Hey, USB Stick. Your USB Stick. Your USB Stick. <laughs> Gonna the next. Okay, then that's about only help. Yeah. Do you need anything? No. Okay, hello. My name is Markus Schneider and I'm um, a member. Okay, eigentlich wollte ich auf Deutsch reden. Um, do you want to choose better English or German? Okay, I try in English. I hope so. Yeah, we are a student project and um, we work in a non profit organization and we have a social networking for students only in the city of Magdeburg. And we developed our framework in the last three new years. And we are, have a lot of cool features and functions. And our idea is um, to bring the, our framework open source that every people or every student all over the world can use them and make their own network with students on their university. And um, this is because an interesting idea because um, we are not interested in collecting data from our users or just uh, have a big use um, to look on private, uh, on the data privacy and something else and make um, their uh, big notice only on this design of our framework. And um, yeah, if you are interested, you can write an email. And our idea is when we have more networks, that the network are uh, um, like peer-to-peer -peer connected to each other, that the, the students can also exchange. And this is a complete new idea, because um, I don't know if anything, uh, um, if anyone has do this before. And so we just interested in people to join us to develop our framework and to make uh, give an alternative to the big um, companies to they only want to collect our data. So thanks for listening. Thanks. Yeah, the next talk will be okay. That's again cancelled. Uh, on EU, EPLI, and community patents, software t patents reloaded. Do you know who is full screen? <coughs> this one, yeah, full screen. One 11, 11. No. <laughs> full screen. Full screen. Anyone knows how to put that full screen? There is no full screen. Sure. On the what? No. There's no full screen.
No, start, start your talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello, hello, okay. Um, my name is Benjamin Henri, I work for uh, FFI Brussels, the Foundation for Free Information Infrastructure. And our association has been created in 1999, uh, and uh, we have been so fighting software patents since then. Um, I've somehow uh, started the Eurolinux petition in 2000, maybe some of you have signed it. And uh, we somehow managed to um, get enough trouble for the software patent directive that was rejected by the European Parliament on the 6th of July 2005, which was uh, uh, two years ago. And uh, two days before the vote, the pro-patent uh, uh, camp, which was mainly the BSA and ECTA, which regroups Philips, Ericsson, Alcatel, and so on, uh, called the, some MEPs in the right-wing uh, part of the European Parliament to ask to uh, reject the directive, which is somehow uncommon for a second reading of a, a European uh, proposal. And... Um, they, reject, they asked for a rejection of the directive because they feared that our amendments, which were against software patents, had somehow a majority in the European Parliament. And they said, at least uh, uh, at that time, they said that they could get software patents through another way in Europe. And they, some of the MEPs, like uh, uh, Alan McCarthy from UK, said on, on her blog or website at that time that uh, they would uh, rediscuss, reopen the issue with the community patent. At that time, I didn't understand what it was about, and uh, I didn't know how you could change the uh, legal situation in Europe with this community patent, which doesn't touch what is patentable and what is not. And the whole uh, trick right now is to say um, we have the European Patent Convention, which says that computer programs are excluded from the field of patentability, and the next article says that they are excluded as such. And the uh, European uh, Patent Office interpret these terms as being uh, if it's um, if you claim in your uh, if you claim in your patent that it's uh, somehow implementing software, they will probably reject it. But if you claim that you claim a machine that has certain features implemented in software, then they will grant you the patent. So um, and this was uh, uh, the case in the last Amazon one-click patent that has been rejected. Um, some weeks ago by the EPO, and uh, one of the examiners said, um, yeah, somehow this, this, this trick is, is well known by all the patent attorneys, and that's the way they get software patents in Europe. Now the situation is that uh, for all 30, uh, 32 members of the European Patent Convention, which is an internal governmental uh, convention, um, signed by most European member states, that you, you have centralization of granting of patents. So if I want a patent for France, uh, I can go to the EPO and, and have a patent for, for France without going to the French patent office. So the, the granting side is centralized. Now the post-granting side, which is the court, is left to the member states. So when you have somehow to... Um, um, attack a patent when it's granted by the European Patent Office, you have to go in several member states where it's delivered in front of each court to either cancel it or fight against it. And the idea is, is that since, uh, I think it was in the end of the 60s, was to create a central court for patents to, in order to get one, one patent, one uh, um, ruling. And so um, there is, um, the EPO was doing lobbying somehow in the European Parliament in 2005, and one of the lobbyists who left this, uh, who left his, his uh, job at the European Patent Office in, as a represent, representative in Brussels said uh, the acrimonious debate over the proposed directive on computer implement inventions might never have arisen if the patent litigation system in Europe had been unified, thereby eliminating the possibility of disparate national rulings on the same patent matter. So it means, it means that the centralization of uh, the, especially validity, because what, the, what the, the patent people wants, the patent establishment wants, is to create a central patent court for validity. So it means uh, if our association wants to uh, go to this court and say the law is exclusive of the patents and uh, um, this patent should be rejected, the court will say, oh, well, we know about this story, we interpret the law this way, 
and uh, um, we follow the case law of the EPO. So the result of, the, of this centralization of the court system can be the same as the directive on software patents, which would legalize the thing, but it will legalize it by case law at, and, and centrally over all, over, all over Europe. And that, that's basically the danger. Um, right now it can be really worse because in terms of damages, when you go, uh, right now the litigation is country by country, so when you go uh, to litigate against an opponent in France, the judge will award the damages for France. But when you have this court system which is centralized, the court will uh, calculate the damages over big, bigger markets. So uh, if your company is somehow affected by this software patent issue, where uh, the damages are calculated in the number of copies of the uh, software distributed, the, 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 the consequences for your company can be even worse. Um, so now you have this, pro this uh, uh, project of uh, signing um, the European Patent Litigation Agreement, which was an international um, treaty project similar to the European Patent Convention, but somehow it conflicts with the EU system, which are the 27 member states. So right now the, the idea is to get um, the, same, the same system, the same proposal as this uh, uh, EPLA, but somehow in the EU framework. And this, uh, when it comes to, um, th this, those kind of decisions requires unanimity in the Council. Uh, so if the Council managed to get no uh, veto rights from Poland or some countries that doesn't want uh, this centralization, they get a central court in Europe. Now, uh, this will change with the new Lisbon Treaty because um, the whole uh, um, voting system will switch from unanimity to qualified majority, which requires 66% of uh, member states to, have a, to pass a decision. And um, so what will happen in the near future is that the Slovene presidency and the French presidency will try to push for having a central court for patents and, and the committee patents, which is somehow where some delegations want still to have um, this central court uh, which is below the European Court of Justice, competent for both for European patents, which are not committee titles, and, and also the uh, future committee patent, which is uh, one patent granted for all the 27 member states. Um, yeah, so I finished. The, basically, right now, the fight, why it's not progressing, is because um, there is a fight between people who want to separate uh, validity and infringement. And, um, for example, when you have... When a company accuses me of patent infringement, I can't claim that the patent is not valid. So, um, and somehow this, this issue about uh, infringement and validity is, is, uh, um, is there for 40 years. So it means that somehow this issue is old and maybe they won't manage to get any, any political decision. Um, so right now that is the status and, and uh, I want to finish. Thank you very much. You're the next. That's cool. Yep. No. Which one? Uh, the Electra? The Electra or the Hello, my name is Markus Raab, uh, and I'm a developer of the Electra Initiative. Okay. Uh, Linux configuration is a mess. Uh, of course, there are many, many things uh, which uh, we have get used to and which are very good and which want to be replaced. Uh, uh, one of them is that the FIS, the file hierarchy uh, standards, uh, give very good choices where to put um, configuration. Then the other point, uh, which is very suitable, that it is um, done for humans. So it is readable and editable. 
and I don't think that uh, in, at any time uh, it, will, uh, it will be desirable uh, that we lose the ability to edit with the uh, editor. But what is the problem and where comes Electra in it? Um, uh, there is um, often a need for an ARP for access uh, to key value pairs. Um, and um, the whole idea is to get a large namespace uh, where, the co where the whole configuration lies. Um, then there should be some uh, standardization of the semantics. For example, that um, um, strong and open uh, has, uh, has, a, had his, has its place uh, where all programs can get it. Uh, and to build an ecosystem. The ecosystem uh, can be showed as that the user uh, does not only configurate programs, uh, but also other tools uh, need access to it. Um, um, Electro is a library, which is very light. Uh, it, has, it has no dependencies and then exact do a documentation uh, and a large testing framework. Uh, and um, we will release uh, in the next year uh, the next uh, stable version, which, which will be supported for at least one year. Um, I will lose some wor words about uh, the ap um, application program interface. Uh, it basically consists of three classes. Um, one of them, the key database, um, uh, provides the access to, the, to the, where the configuration will be stored in the end. Uh, it gets and sets key sets, uh, which is a set uh, of keys, and the key is an atomic unit uh, where the value is stored and also a comment. Um, then um, let's uh, introduce how we can uh, fix the problem uh, with the global namespace. Um, there um, uh, is uh, a system tree uh, where all the configuration, uh, uh, like in ETC, is now. Uh, and etc. Uh, and um, there um, is um, there can be various uh, database backends. The um, uh, idea of it is because there are uh, various requir requirements. For example, uh, there can be performance issues uh, for for many keys, but other application more need a secure have security issues. For example, at the say shadow. Um, there, uh, it would be desirable to have ACLs uh, so that every password can be changed um, without a set to AD program. Um, but uh, others, uh, for example, Apache, the, the, uh, the users want, uh, want their old Apache configuration files. And here uh, comes the clue. You can mount in at a, at a point. Um, that um, under system SV Apache, uh, the Apache configuration will be used in. Uh, I can show it uh, because on this computer it is not installed, but it works now in the current uh, release candidate. Um, then um, another, uh, um, now I show you some things uh, which um, uh, will give you a, a, an idea how flexible it is. Uh, you can export and import um, trees or the whole configuration. You can net cut the XML files over the network or whatever you want to do with it. Uh, of course, you can do, and there is a GUI uh, edit tool for the whole configuration. You can uh, make um, in Python um, at, um, uh, uh, network services with which put uh, a get you where you can. Um, show the configuration or change it. Um, and uh, the, 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 I will give you a, a big picture of the, of the thing. And the configuration uh, utopia is uh, that all uh, that the programs uh, use an ab ex uh, abstraction layer, uh, um, which, um, which uh, makes uh, them portable to different systems and to do um, every desirable configuration format and database. Um, yeah, there's uh, many people involved, um, and I hope some of you are interested and may uh, join us too. Uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks.
Yeah, okay. Did my... So the next talk is about towards the free software world. Sorry? There's one in between. Uh, okay, the game. Once you know the rules, you can never stop playing. You gave me slides? Oh, uh, yeah. Where? Game talk. Ah, that one. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Okay, um, so this is something something different without any computers. It's um, about a silly little game, um, which is actually a kind of virus for, um, mind virus for people. So I will now infect you with this virus. Um, if you don't want to, you can just close your eyes, close your ears and not look. Um, now, it's a really simple game. It's got two, uh, three rules. Oh. I'm sorry, um, this makes it a little strange. Um, so, it is a little more strange. All right. Um, so, rule number one. Once you know the rules of the game, you're playing the game. So, this will be you in a few seconds. Number two, whenever you think of the game, you lose it. And number three, if you lose the game, you must announce it to all other players in your vicinity and are then safe from losing for 30 minutes. So essentially the goal of the game is to forget about it, which is rather difficult if you're surrounded by people who also play the game and continuously remind you that they lose. So now that you know the rules, you're all lost. <laughs> and, and you'll find that um, once you maybe go home and look at the recording and watch this talk again, you lose again. And then you look at other recordings and think, oh no, I lost at the last recording, and then you lose again. And then you I know, go into town and see at the shop new games, and then you lose again. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bad thing. Um, anyway, um, I uh, learned about that game from a guy um, from the University of Cambridge, and that was about eight months ago, and I, uh, I lost about, I don't know, at least five times every day. And of course, um, Told, told you to, my, to the people in my vicinity and now to you, and I don't think I'll ever stop losing. Um, but nobody seems to hate me for it. That's a good thing. So you can, you can tell it to other people and spread the infection. Um, anyway, um, so it, it's, it's really in the core of your brain after a while. And yeah, that's all already. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, now we have the presentation towards a free software world. Yeah. Hello. So towards a free, uh, my name is Mario Beling. I'm. Um, they have uh, invented a nice title for me here, matchmaker. Um, I bring people together um, for this project, Fosbridge. Um, it's titled towards a free software world because I think. Um, we can only build a free software world not just by programming it and by working on it. We have actually to involve people. And um, our goal is not just involve people by um, uh, uh, like doing projects here in, in Europe, but actually for, um, um, for uh, what's the next slide? For, um, uh, with, uh, so what we want to do with FOSS is um, development collaboration. I don't know, maybe uh, a lot of you know development aid. Now uh, the new term is development cooperation because we don't just want to give passive aid. We want actually to collaborate and um, free and open source software is a great tool to collaborate um, for mutual benefit. So the project, what's it about? Um, project to support development cooperation with free and open source software. Set that focus to small and medium sized enterprises. So we actually want to work with companies. Um, and it's a project consortium um, from Europe. Um, it's uh, three countries involved, um, Germany, France, and Spain. And um, we have local partners in Asia. Right now we focus on Vietnam. Vietnam, why? Because 2003 they decided um, to switch their infrastructure to open source. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Like there's some lobbying of Microsoft going on and, and so on. I'm not going into detail now. 
you know about these kind of things. And it's sponsored by the European Union, the German government, Spanish government, and has started in 2007 already. Um, who's involved? It's Invent of Germany, INRIA, um, is an organization from France, IOIT, our local partner in Vietnam, and the associate partner, Synetic. It's an organization promoting a free and open source software in Spain. The goal? A few goals, um, increase awareness of uh, free and open source software in Vietnam, development uh, uh, through forced education in Vietnam, education sector, business sector, um, yeah. increase expert knowledge on innovative forced business models um, in Vietnam. So what we do is bringing companies over to Vietnam to do joint projects. It's the next point. They could work together um, on a common source code, for instance, with a small spelling mistake, okay. Um, or like they could provide services together, do joint projects, um, and um, yeah, even if they don't uh, work together, they just use the same software. Uh, we hope at one point uh, Vietnamese companies will contribute to the code, and um, yeah, so everyone has a, has a benefit. Um, yeah, and the last point, giving companies access to a new FOSS network and ecosystem. Um, normally, FOSS companies are not that big. Uh, we have a few uh, big ones, which is MySQL. They uh, participate somehow also in the program, but also they um, um, said like they don't have really the resources to participate uh, as compared to Microsoft could just send someone to, um, uh, yeah, to, a, to a country and they don't care about the return, the immediate return of interest. So, um, yeah, that's with small companies, there's always the question of uh, resources and money. Okay, um, so what we do, activity, training, workshops on FOSS, um, uh, workshops where you can get uh, Linux certificates, studying business cases. Um, we also do communications workshops. There's always the question of um, uh, different cultures working together on joint projects. Um, we even sometimes have um, difficulties here um, when people work together over mailing lists and over tools. So um, there are some workshops. And um, yeah, and also how to create, for instance, open source communities, how to work with them. Um, it's um, a question here, for instance. Activity number two, business matchmaking, actually bringing the companies together. And that's why I uh, wanted to give this small talk here. Uh, maybe some of you uh, work in a, a small company, in a free and open source software company. Maybe they're interested. Please get in touch with me or uh, you can sign up on the website. The program has started, but we still uh, invite new companies to participate. And there's also a support scheme available for uh, the initiation period. So uh, um, small companies could be eligible. For instance, we could support them with uh, travel costs. is uh, financed by the European Union. Um, we could talk to you. We could um, sometimes it's just bringing people in touch, yeah. Because we have the local partners. We have the um, Institute of uh, Internet Technology in uh, Hanoi. So um, yeah, if you're interested, interested, just get in touch with me. Um, who can take part? Depends on open source strategy of the enterprise. So it has to be a FOSS company. If you use uh, some not open source. Uh, um, um, uh, software, it's okay, but the main part should be uh, free and open source software. Um, also, the question of level uh, uh, and strategy of interna internationalization. So, uh, uh, you should be a company that aims to uh, work in, uh, with other countries or, or with in other regions or somehow with uh, partners also. Um, and it must be a EU company because it's EU financed, uh, so um, must be a EU company. And of course, it also depends on the interest uh, uh, of companies in Vietnam to work together with you. Active participation as well. Um, what already happened, we had workshops, we had meetings of over four, 40 European uh, companies, no, over 40 companies, European and Vietnamese, in Hanoi in November. And uh, so there are already 50 partnership contracts signed, uh, articles on linux.com, heise.de, and uh, uh, and others, you know, could also help your company. Some PR um, would be nice. Some Vietnamese companies taking part. I don't know if anyone knows uh, some of them. We have uh, one company even has uh, 800 um, developers, so they are already quite large ones. Uh, for Vietnamese companies, uh, though, um, 
in Vietnam, they don't make the big difference between force and so on. It's, it's not so, you know, I, I don't know if anyone has worked here with the people from Asia. They, they don't always make the big difference. For them, the idea is to create a business and to earn um, income, of course. Um, what we want to help them, we want to show them um, or help them to do it in a free and open source uh, ecosystem or environment. So, okay, some European companies at the end. Here, um, we have a uh, night lab. Some people know this, maybe uh, Bull, Bull France, Bull is quite famous. Uh, Gonicos, they're involved in the um, uh, Linux project. Uh, recently uh, switched uh, 13,000 telephones in Munich, in the city of Munich, to uh, open source and uh, voice over IP. So, uh, some companies involved here. Yeah, get in touch with me. Here's my contact details, or you can just have a look on our website, fosbridge.org. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, the next talk will be on OLPC. Oh, okay. Samuel Tan is gone. Samuel Tan is gone. Okay. Uh, no, you have slides on PDF. Then you should take those. That's your Mac. So, um, Samuel Klein already left, unfortunately. He had to catch, catch his plane. Uh, so I'll sort of speak a little bit for him now and uh, I'll speak about the plans that we made for the old PC developers program. So, do you have a keynote? Okay. So, um, uh, my name is Aaron Kaplan. We uh, founded the old PC group, local group in Austria. And sort of, I, we, we planned a new developers program for old PC. So the idea is how you get, does that switch actually? Yes. How you get uh, your XO, basically. So um, there has been a big shortage in old PC laptops. Um, some part of it is because the, the production capacities are not fully uh, up and running. Uh, the other part is like, um, countries like Ur Uruguay and Peru, Peru ordered, and there was a give one, get one program which was only for the United States and Canada. And even Canada didn't get laptops for Christmas. So um, basically I went there with another colleague of mine, Christoph, and we sort of complained a bit there. <laughs> we went to Cambridge and we talked with them and said, you cannot exclude the community. And this was very well received. So I have very good news for you. Actually, my talk will be much shorter. Yeah? Um, I have very good news for you. We have around 200 XOs per month coming in the new contributors program. This is worldwide, but still it's a nice thing. And um, basically, we set up a contributors program now, which does not only include developers, but it can also include like educators, graphics artists, artists in general, whatever. Um, it's, it's all documented there. And just watch this page. It will change a few times. It's a wiki. Um, Samuel loves wikis. He's from um, me, uh, Wikipedia also. He's very active there. Um, so we'll have a, a contributors program where you basically register. You register your name, your address, your telephone number. This will be stored in a database. Um, if, if your uh, program application is like um, makes sense, you will basically get, get a laptop. And um, then we ask you, like the main thing is like, if this laptop stays at home in your place in the corner, it doesn't make sense. So what we would ask you then to um, do with the laptop in case you don't have time because you're, you work for university, you have a job, etc., is that um, you hand it over to another interested developer or contributor or to your local Chaos Computer Club uh, group. So uh, what we had in Vienna was a, a group process, 
uh, we had XOs and we shared them amongst each other. This also helped in community building. Now, I think you still wanted to say a few words here, right? Okay. Yes, hello. My name is Chris Hagel, not the Christoph you mentioned who went to Boston with Aaron. So I joined OPC Austria a few months ago and started developing different things. Okay, sorry. Better now? Okay. So the point I wanted to make is it's not, you don't have to be a developer, like Aaron said, to apply for this program. It's basically the idea what counts. There are many people scattered around the world which are like, have a bit of spare time and if the project is not like huge, might want to join you on your idea. And if it's a small idea, it should be no problem. And if it's a big, if it's a big project idea you have, you can get together with the local groups around your place. You can get on the IRC channel, channels and usually people are happy to help you out with your ideas. So basically we are also looking for anyone having questions. Okay. okay. We'll just hand out like still flies that you can take home with the URL. And um, but I see we have right. okay. uh, just a quick question. Does the world include non-European Union countries like Croatia, for example? Of course. Just checking. Thank okay. you. This is a worldwide program, right? No, that was, that was dedicated for the US, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> to give one, get one? Yep, I agree. Yep. Yes, um, one of the, that's a good point, actually. Um, usually, very often, like projects which you submit there will run on an emulator, and there's a, quite a few options. One is VMware. You can download the whole uh, image of the uh, old PC laptop, and it runs on VMware. You can have a Ubuntu Live CD. You can have Ubuntu or Debian packages, which just change your window manager to the default window manager of uh, old PC uh, to Sugar. Or you can have QAMO. There's a bunch of uh, possibilities. Yeah? So very often what we end up doing when we code something for that is um, either we have an application which really requires the actual hardware, or um, we uh, develop in the emulator on the local PC, and then just you know meet and test and have our jam and coding session, which is quite nice, actually. OK, I think you, we shouldn't have questions. You said that, right? OK. okay. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. So, we have the next talk by the same person. <laughs> that's, that's because I, I, I registered uh, SJ, who unfortunately couldn't make it. Um, this is this one? So, um, so I'll talk more about like the thing which I'm more like personally more deeper involved, like um, and not you know representing any organization or so. This is uh, this uh, all this RNG project. Uh, many of you know Freifunk, the Freifunk network. They use all this R, uh, and some of them also some of the nodes also use the Batman protocol. So I wanted to briefly talk about, come on, doesn't work here. I tried. Oh, here, okay, thanks. Um, I wanted to briefly talk about our progress with uh, working on all this R, which has um, um, hopefully big impact on all the Freifunk style networks in the world. All this R is RFC uh, 3626. It's called uh, all R because it's open, uh, optimized link state routing. Um, it was a diploma thesis by Andreas Tönnesen in Norway, and it became the de facto standard of mesh uh, protocols on layer three in all of these Freifunk, Funk for Athens, wireless, um, et cetera, networks. Yeah? And um, since it was a diploma thesis, at some point you want the diploma thesis to be finished, 
so at some point you sort of become a bit sloppy with the code. Um, it was a pain of the ass to maintain. Uh, there, there were only like patches all the time to it and nobody really cleaned it up. Um, what the effect was that it at some point became quite slow in the Freifunk networks. Now at some point people decided uh, this is enough. Yeah? In Vienna, the Funkfeuer networks, people decided this is enough, we need to clean up. Uh, in Berlin, uh, Elektra and a few others decided we need something new. So basically we have like the two branches now, evolution versus revolution. Um, and uh, our project is basically to clean up all this R and to make it very, um, very, well, per per performant. <laughs> so uh, f this should be fish eye, not fishy, okay. Um, so uh, what we, did we achieve in the last year? Uh, main credits go to Hannes Gredler, Sven Ola Tücke, and Bernd Petrovic. Um, we achieved that uh, the fish eye algorithm finally works. Nobody noticed that it didn't work yeah? um, for years. Yeah? So this works now. That means we have less um, uh, packets going over the air. It means like uh, there is no more air time for the actual data to, to um, go over the air. Then the main issue was the CPU load was much too high. Um, this was the CPU load before on, on the Funkfire network in Vienna with 400 nodes. It was around 60%. Now it's here, it's under uh, 1%. Actually, I exaggerated that graph uh, because so that you can still see a green line. Um, the scalability was like that before. The Dijkstra calculations for the shortest path, short, shortest path calculation from A to the internet, uh, from a node to the internet gateway, uh, behaved like that before. Now it's here on the green line. So we are pretty sure that it actually scales now. Of course, there might be issues, but we'll clean them up on the way. So um, briefly, to give you an, um, a preview of what's going to happen in the next probably year, uh, there is still a bug now, which we're working on it. It's uh, NLQ, the one parameter sometimes turns to zero, means like the route switch is it's not necessary, it's a bug. Um, so in case you notice something like that in your Freifunk network in Berlin, have a little bit of patience, please, and g give us good bug reports. Then in, we also learned that uh, in Berlin, uh, you have private IP spaces and you have a NAT somewhere, so your packets go out here that way. At some point, the route might switch to a different gateway, to a different DSL line. That means your session is still stuck here. It won't, the packets uh, want to come in here now. It doesn't work. So we'll have a solution for that, hopefully soon. And then um, we'll also have a new algorithm called CSN, which is basically um, will we'll again uh, clear up the air a bit, less packets. Um, all the topology information, basically uh, regularly now all this R sends out the whole topology graph of the whole network to the, the other nodes, right? This is like too much, so we can do uh, much better by simply synchronizing only the differences. Um, and then we are thinking about a new metric, it's called ETT. It's basically the well-known ETX metric divided by the bandwidth of the link. So you also recognize the bandwidth. And then something really sexy is going to probably come. I can't promise it 100% yet because it's like the hardest part is multipath routing. Basically, when, what OLSR does now, it finds the best route in this dynamic mesh network. One single route. So all the packets, as long as this route is good, will go over that way. So what, what happens when all your neighbors have now nodes and you actually, you could go around the buildings in different routes in parallel. You could send out different flows in parallel. So uh, as soon as you, you have that, your network really grows. The bandwidth, the total bandwidth grows more or less, um, minus interference, um, with the number of nodes. Yeah, the more nodes, the more bandwidth, okay? So this is like a really a nice, very nice target for us. Okay, this is it basically. Uh, so the future looks bright. Um, thanks a lot for listening. <laughs> thanks. Then, laptop. No. Okay, so the next talk is on Search Filer. Search here by Georg Yannick.
Yes, hello, my name is Georg. I want to show you Sachilo. And Sachilo is basically a command line for the web. So we can call it with um, Sachilo.net. A cookie, okay, don't need it. And we choose German because my examples are in German. And again, hmm. can I allow for this session? Okay. <laughs> um, so, for example, we can type in uh, DB for Deutsche Bahn and then um, Berlin, comma, Hamburg. Hmm, this is a Deutsche Bahn, it's not me. <laughs> okay. Um, so we come directly to the to the timetable of this of the Deutsche Bahn. Uh, another example is we um, can do a phone book lookup of a German phone book. Let's say we look for somebody called Meyer in Dresden. Hmm. <laughs> okay. They're full of cookies. The pages. Um. Okay, so can we come directly to the to the phone book page of this person of the people called Maya? Um, oh my God! Can I? Is it some some way to switch it off? Okay, a third example. Um, we can look for a, a law in a German. Um, where is the paragraph sign? <laughs> there is no paragraph sign. Okay, so let's leave this example. We could look up also a, a law of a German uh, in the German uh, laws, and the keyword for this would be a paragraph. So basically, the idea is we always have a keyword, and then the arguments what we are looking for. And um, so we just don't need um, also to type all the stuff into this input field. We can also install a plugin. Um, and then we can type all the stuff up here in this in this field, which I won't do now. But um, so it's not you don't need to go always on this page. And um, some easy examples. Let's look for in Google for something. It's just G. Um, or we just look in Google for pages only in a German language, which is done by GDE. And now we have only German pages. So let's see where the comments are stored. Um, they're stored all in the wiki, which means that you can all edit them. Uh, let's go for Google, the example. So this is the, the wiki page of a comment. And uh, they start always with the definitions and then with the examples. And we just take a look to the definition. It always starts with a comment opening tag and the closing tag. And uh, inside we have the attributes. The, the easy comments are just defined by a keyword, which is in this case G. And then we just uh, put up the placeholders uh, somewhere inside. We can also use some system variables like the, the language. So here it's put uh, the, the, the language of the interf of um, the language of the Sachilo interface, which is used in the moment. So it would be translated un into DE, and this would tell Google to show its uh, interface as in, in German. A more complicated comment is a regex comment, so we can define a regular expression. And uh, this catches basically all starting with a G, followed by two letters, and then followed by any string. And um, so this was a GDE comment, for example. We just look for pages in a certain language. And then they are all translated into this um, URL with $1 is this the language, and $2 is the, um, yes, the, the query. And OK, one another feature is uh, we can avoid clashes of keywords by, um, by a language attribute. An example for this is the comment for lastfm. It's a, no? it's a, I don't know, maybe you know it. It's a page for, uh, for listening, for sharing music um, tastes, and you can c connect to other people. And there are s several uh, language versions, and they're all split up here with the same keyword. But every comment is assigned to a language. So we have, um, for example, uh, 
the English version with language EN, language DE for the German version, and so on. So you can avoid clashes of comments with a, with a language attribute. Okay, the last feature, um, you can set up user comments, which means that... Um, mm, Yes, thank you. My username is uh, Jorges in this uh, wiki, so uh, I defined my own user comments, which are only uh, valid to me. So I defined an own comment to, um, to look up uh, trains up from my home. So when I just uh, want to use it, I go on my Sergio page. And uh, here I just need to type in DB. Um, Yes, and just to where I want to go. So, okay, let's take Hamburg. It's no umlaut. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just knows it starts from Griechenland where I live to the place where I want to go. And um, yeah, at the end, some tricks. Um, the Deutsche Bahn has also a text version. Um, which is called with DBT, and then you can use, uh, maybe you don't know, just the, um, the number plates of the cars, like the, the, the abbreviations, which means BHH, and you're directly at a um, text version. Okay. Um, yeah, so at the end, I think this is very useful for mobile phones because when you have only 12 uh, keys, you don't want to type or don't want to click uh, lots of stuff. So, but the problem is I don't have a mobile phone yet uh, with a UMTS and uh, uh, I'm using internet. So if you would like to use it for mobile phones and want to give me some feedback, for example, what plugin is needed for what, how could I improve it, then I would be really happy to have, hear from you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next talk will be about Lintronix, a snort-based RDS, if Emma Pschura is around. Doesn't seem so. So then about Omega Wiki from Purodo and Blismach, yeah? Yes, I link of my Okay, um, um, Omega, I'm going to talk about Omega Wiki, which is a project that was formerly known under several other names like Ultimate Wiktionary or Wiktionary Z. Um, this is a project to make a dictionary of all worlds of all languages and some more information. Um, we just heard about the OPLC project. Um, much of the data which is in Omega Wiki currently is going into the OPLC project just by the way. Uh, it's an open source, open content, and free collaborative project. That means um, it's uh, based on MediaWiki plus some extensions. That means basically when software is at the point that this is possible, everyone can contribute to the uh, project and, um, and, and enter uh, dictionary data. Currently, we have some 600 contributors. Um, and the wiki is not open for public editing yet because um, of software problems which require that persons who edit do have some deeper knowledge of the inner functioning. This will be eliminated in the future. Um, software is at a point that we can prove that, that it shows some proof of concept and that one can see what is intended with it. Uh, when we look at a word say you go in the wiki and let the wiki tell you what it knows about a word like L-A-N-G. Then first you see that it happens to um, 
be present in several languages. Uh, there's no pointer here, but you can see from the, uh, from the side that there are many more. I just made a pretty short screen shot to get it here on this page. Um, if you click one of those open by clicking on the plus sign besides them, oh, yes, each of those languages has the word which is spelled L-A-N-G. Um, when you click one of those open, you get some structured information about that word. And also here you have just a little bit of it. Um, we, in Omega Wiki, we deal with words and expressions. Sometimes you have expressions which convey one piece of information but consist of several, several words. So in English you have to ridicule someone which can be translated to German, jemanden durch den Kakao ziehen, but it doesn't make sense to retranslate it in English as to pull someone through the hot chocolate. Obviously, that's an, that would be a mistake. So when it comes to translation, we have to consider meaning, not only words. And meaning is one of the things that we uh, use in Omega Wiki <clears throat> to find and uh, correlate translations. A single word can have several meanings. There are plenty of those which we use for joking. And Omega Wiki treats all words of all languages and all of their meanings. So here is an example which is not, what nicht besonders übersichtlich ist, but you can see there are three instances of long. And besides them, you have several different meanings explained that they can have. Um, in order to single out a specific meaning, we write um, an, an, something which we call a definition. Here is a list of definitions for the word, I don't know which one, um, in several languages. This is one meaning, and the definition has been translated between these languages. Um, okay short break. Um, putting a definition towards a word is nothing new. That is something which every single language dictionary uses all the way since centuries. But in Omega Wiki, um, we tie together an expression or a word in a language together with its definition. And this gives a building block inside Omega Wiki, which is called defined meaning. A def defined meaning is a word and a definition of one of its meanings pulled together. And only those things are being translated between languages. So we don't actually translate words, we translate defined meanings. So that in the process of translation we don't lose meanings. Um, there's a way to translate a word into the same language. This is um, synonym and we call synonyms and translations. We treat synonyms and translations alike. Here is a list of um, some, what is it? Uh, I think it's the, I choose the German word Lehrer, and it has several synonyms and several translations in several languages. You see that some languages appear several times here in this list. <clears throat> These things are all identical except one, in the, th in the fourth row, you, you see that in the uh, column under the heading identical meaning, there is no check mark. This is another interesting feature that, needs, that we need to have. Um, translations need not be exact. Um, sometimes they are, sometimes they are not, and sometimes, sometimes they can't even be exact. Um, Okay, there's some, um, uh, there exists a very, very well known um, a scholarly thesis about that. Whoever is interested reads the pretty good Wikipedia article about it. Some translations are exact by their nature. Names of persons or places or technical terms usually translate pretty precise and there's no no way uh, to confuse them. Others aren't. Just two simple samples. Um, if you have the German word Schachtel, Kiste, Box, they are all pretty much the same, but not quite the same. And some, sometimes you can use 
either of those words for a real world object, sometimes you can't. Another example is a differentiation in um, what we call um, the concept behind something. In English you have the word teacher, in German you have Lehrer und Lehrerin, but you, and you can translate them between each other, and these translations are good and valid, and you, there's nothing to complain about, only they are not, uh, they are, when you have the English word, you have a choice how to translate it, and if you don't know the gender, you have either to make a choice or, the, or to circumvent this loss, or this lack of information. Of course, you can always create exact translations for those by qualifying the words further. You say male teacher or female teacher, or you choose to say Lehrer oder Lehrerin in your translation. Um, fuzzy information, when it gets translated, usually um, ends up in losing information, a process which is also known as stille post effect. Um, in Omega Wiki, we assume that translations are uh, reflexive and transitive. That means when someone enters a translation in one direction, always the other direction, the reverse direction, is included automatically. And if two people enter translations and they share one word in one language, then we effectively have six translations by just using the fact that translations, that the translation of a translation is again a translation of the original. Um, yes. You see, um, in the, at the lower end you have one and two and you have this double arrow. So this, this reflects symmetry. These are taken care of by defined meanings. If you have ambiguities, you have several defined meanings with one word. And we do not translate words, we translate defined meanings. So we always take into account what the special meaning of a word is. Um, these, the symmetry and transitivity helps us to, to reduce this, the workload which is needed to make a bilingual directory of N languages. Uh, with the method that Omega Wiki uses, it scales, the effort to make it scales about two times N. The classical method that publishers of um, dictionaries have used up to now scales with N square. That means collecting all data is, um, is uh, much more efficient than just collecting part of all data. Um, in Omega Wiki, you can relate something to expressions. You can relate expressions to each other. You can assign attributes to expressions. You can put them in collections. And one of the interesting collections is that once you have the grammar terms of a language in Omega Wiki, you can relate words and expressions to those grammar terms, which means that you classify them and that you then know how they are grammatically used in languages that have grammars. Um, okay, and also one of the goals which Omega Wiki has but not started yet is to have inflected forms, forms changed by grammar of all words in the directory as well, um, so that in the end you could go to any website and point on any word and say, click on it and have it linked to Omega Wiki, and Omega Wiki gives you, gives you a complete rundown of all the grammar properties of this word, which language it is in, and what its meaning is, and how to translate it, and possibly anything more, where the Wikipedia article is about it, if there's any, and so on. So I thank you for listening, and if you want to play with it, go to the wiki. It's omegawiki.org. Okay, so the next talk is about XMAME, virtual en entity. Take that. I will start the slides.
Okay, I start talking. Hello, I'm Max Dame, and I'm here to present for the first time a new license, which I started to work recently. And um, this license is called Virtual Entity, and it's about uh, uh, licenses, licensing uh, digital works. So net art and uh, any type of file that will go through the net. Can you, can you open it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's just a splash. So like uh, I have here a few assumptions, which are like uh, I started to think of uh, what, what is a digital file and what's the difference with everything else. And one of the main differences is that any copy is uh, uh, exactly identical to the original. So we don't have any more this distinction. And uh, in, in a certain sense, like uh, since a file uh, through the net will proliferate and go through, uh, through the net and all over, uh, in a quite free uh, way, I can imagine like internet and like uh, digital creations are uh, very similar to uh, nature. In this sense, uh, I, I think uh, there is no owner of digital files. There is no owner of uh, culture as well and of nature. So uh, I, I'm thinking of a license to to track uh, the history of media files because uh, if it happened to you to, to work online and to, to put your, uh, your works out there, you, you will be always very curious to know what, what happened to the files you made and where are they going and what, uh, what is the connection. And uh, like any other license I, I always uh, try to use and, and experience was uh, creating a, a distance between me or, uh, or the creator of a file and who is using it. Because at the end, what, what I do if I use a Creative Commons is putting a, a link to the website, the Creative Commons website, and that's all. I would never know what are the people doing with my files, with, with the files I, I put online and what's their um, destiny. As well, I, I, would li I think a license is not only, uh, should also like, give some instruction about uh, how, how did I create this work, how would I like this to be used, and, or something to be shown. And I think it, it would be interesting to have a more direct connection between users and creators, or different creators that share their works. So, um, and create a feedback system and a discussion about what, what happened to a file. So I was thinking that this license I, 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 I'm talking about is not about uh, distribution, it's not about royalties, it's not about lawyers, not about sustainability and not about um, uh, property. So we are not talking about these things. We want to do something else. Uh, I started to think about media types to be defined by a substance. So, like, divide them in a very simple uh, way, like audio, video, text, picture. And uh, I, I think metadata have a limit because they depend on format and co formats and codec, and they uh, cannot be expanded. Of course, I can expand uh, metadata on a, on a single file. But what I am expanding will, uh, will not be effective because, okay, we, we have one file and we have all the copies, no? If I edit metadata on one file, I will not affect all of the instances that are around the world of this file. So it's, it will be just my own file that will start to, to, to go around and be copied with the new information I, now, I, I am going to add. So there is no, not an absolute reference that contains information around the file and its use. So what I was thinking, I started to think about creating a sort of sort of a file which could be external to, to, the, to the single file and have a, a sort of, uh, like a sort of sole kernel, like something that uh, the, um, like the main creator of the file, the, the, the person who makes a native file, uh, will uh, will write this sort of metadata in a, in a kernel, and he will own the permission of this soul. But mm, the space of the soul will be expandable, so that you can add your logs on 
on the um, on the on the source. For example, I can say I use this uh, this text as a still as um, as a part of a video and uh, add this information to the text to the to the soul of the text I took the the reference from. So how how to do this? Uh, like yeah, the, the native file is mm, something li like a concept I, I'm talking about, which is like when you create a file for the first time, no, and you and you put it online. In a sense, this is the the very first. No, there's no original, but there is a first imprint online or, or on your own hard drive. You you start this this file for the very first time. You created it. Okay, that's where it, uh, a file is born. And the absolute creator is the, the person who starts to make this this first version of the file. And uh, the, this, ent the, this uh, virtual entity is also about um, you know uh, creating a sort of uh, like tracking the generations of files. So what, what uh, a new file if if a new file contains other files, you will have like these instructions, these addresses that uh, will uh, allow you to map through the, gene the different files that, are, um, that have been used to create the new one. So that's a bit, uh, like a schema. I have like foo.org, that's a video, and I have all of these uh, foo.org that are around the net and can be copied on any server. And I have all of these that contain a sort of address to the soul, which is somewhere else. And every time some user adds some information in the logs part, every, every, every other uh, file will, will be pointing to the same information. So this will, uh, will grow, will tend to grow the soul or to die as well, you know. Um, while the kernel will be owned by the person who starts the file. Yeah, it starts. It starts from a wiki. Yeah, it's like yeah, I started to think uh, from from a wiki uh, concept. Uh, it's not. It doesn't have to be that different. And so, like how to link, how to link this? I was thinking of um, adding a sort of key code in the file header and to check with a sort of MD5 or something similar, the integrity of a file so that you, you, you go to the real uh, soul and not a fake soul. And then there is like, I mean, this is totally new. Eh? That's uh, some possible development of such an idea. So, sorry? Yeah, uh, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I go on? But what, what do you mean that, 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 that I'm, I'm saying that this is free while I talk about, I talk about versions and permissions and is that like... You're not, you're not obliged to, huh? Like no, no user is obliged to say I use this. If you want to, you can add this information to the to, to the soul of the file. Or if you have questions, if you want to go uh, reach the, the 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 main creator and talk to him, you can, but you don't have to. As as well, I mean, I, I can imagine that such a system would be used, especially at the beginning, as a prototype by a few people. But then, uh, like. Do you want to make a, a soul of any file you do? Maybe not. But is there a file you want to make a soul for? Yes, maybe there's something you, you, you would want to do like this. So like I, I, there would be like a sort of soul repository where you, like all, all these souls are stored with the informations. And I was thinking of a soul surfer because I, it's not necessary to use a browser, but maybe some, some other command line or something more uh, usable for people. To, to go and access this, uh, like to, to, to verify the, the code that connects the, a certain file to, to a certain like um, bunch of information and go there and edit it. And then of course the anti-spam, <laughs> because uh, that could be really like uh, evil. Huh? 
of the soul. Like uh, the soul is is open. I'm I'm I have I think like the the the, the main metadata should be owned by the creators, and you cannot come there and change it. The logs. I think that that's tricky because if I put the logs that any any person adding a log will own uh, his own logs if somehow that gets filled with spam how do you delete that so that that's something to to figure out still I think but uh, something quite free like you have the kernel is the hard part let's say and the rest can be like more uh, more free that's it so if uh, you have com comments and suggestions, I'm uh, really happy. At the moment, you cannot see that. It's virtualentity.org. It's really new. I just, it, it's a wiki right now. So if you want to write something about this, you feel free to go there and uh, add your opinions. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so the next talk is about security and statistical analysis tools for the human rights community. All right, my name is uh, Annie Harrison. I'm from San Francisco. I work for an organization called Benetech, and we're based in Silicon Valley. Oops. So uh, I want to talk today about a couple of our free software tools that we've developed for human rights organizations and how they're being used around the world. Since uh, 1991, our human rights data analysis group, and you can read about them at hrd.org, has been developing statistical analysis techniques to analyze witness testimony and develop defensible evidence of large-scale human rights violations. This data is used by prosecutors and truth commissions to help establish a clear historical record. And to do this, we developed a tool called Analyzer, which is an open source database tool based on the who did what to whom data model. And we use this tool to structure and quantify the sequence of events that take place during violations of civil and political rights. Now we did this because most testimony and evidence about human rights violations is anecdotal data that can be manipulated, discredited, and distorted. We subject this data to statistical analysis that can be replicated by other people to verify the findings. We believe that scientifically defensible answers about the magnitude and statistical patterns of violence can help overcome partisan arguments about blame and victimization, and that this data can be used to hold perpetrators accountable, end impunity, and begin the process of justice and reconciliation. We make our findings available to scholars, lawyers, historians, journalists, hackers, human rights and civil society groups, and the families of people who've been killed or disappeared. We analyze information from many sources, lots of different sources, including individual testimonies, legal depositions, surveys, administrative records from morgues and cemeteries, exhumation reports, prison, police, military, customs, and immigration records. And we encourage you to share and collect this kind of information when you come across interesting documents. To convert anecdotal information into information that can be used for analysis, we code the data in ways that allow each type of violation to be classified into consistent, repeatable definitions. When we quantify the total number of abuses in a given conflict, we determine where the reports overlap so that we can more accurately determine the number of victims or violations. 
that we're working with. Now, we provide this training and support to local organizations, and we've worked with about nine truth commissions uh, around the world, including truth commissions in El Salvador, Haiti, South Africa, Guatemala, Peru, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and East Timor. We also provide data analysis for NGOs in Bosnia, Chad, Colombia, Cambodia, Guatemala, and Sri Lanka. We provided analysis of mass human rights violations in Kosovo that were used in the war crimes trial against Slobodan Milosevic at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And this same evidence is now being used in the prosecution of his co-indictees, the members of the former Serbian High Command. We just released a new report which provides a scientific estimation of the number of missing people in the Colombian state of Casanare including those who have never been documented. We are trying to statistically document people who don't exist in the records. Our analysis suggests that between 30 and 40 percent of missing persons in this area in Casanare were unreported, unreported from 1986 to 2007. And this report is now being used by Colombian NGOs to assist further investigations of murders and disappearances across Colombia, where we believe there are a lot of mass graves. We're now working with the Liberian Truth and Reconciliation Commission to help them manage and analyze information from victim and witness statements from their 14-year civil war. In addition to the analyzer software, we've also developed MARTIS, which is a free open source database software tool that helps human rights investigators collect, organize, encrypt, back up, and distribute information bulletins about human rights violations. You can download, examine, and vet the MARTIS source code on SourceForge or up on MARTIS.org up here, and we encourage you to do so. It's customizable, it's open source, it's a Java-based tool that runs on all operating systems, and it's available in Spanish, Russian, French, Thai, English, and Arabic. I'd like to give you a quick example of the kind of threat model that this tool was designed to address. In August of 2005, a woman who works for Equitas, a forensics NGO in Colombia, had her taxi hijacked in Medellin, and she had her laptop stolen at gunpoint because she used MARTIS to encrypt and back up the sensitive witness testimony on her laptop, she could calmly hand over her laptop to her assailants without giving them a hit list of witnesses. So the robber got nothing but encrypted data. MARTIS is now being used in 15 countries around the world, including Colombia, Guatemala, Iraq, Nepal, Russia, Kenya, and Thailand, where a group of Burmese NGOs is using it to secure their data from intense surveillance from the Thai, Burmese, and Chinese intelligence authorities. In the US, where we have some human rights problems of our own, of course, MARTIS is being used to secure case information by attorneys representing prisoners at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. The largest MARTIS project is located in Guatemala City, where over 50,000 MARTIS bulletins have been generated to secure some of the 80 million documents in a huge recently discovered Guatemalan National Police Archive, which is the largest known human rights archive in Latin America. It's an amazing project. If you'd like to contact me for more information, uh, please do go to our websites, email me at my address, or I'll be around here later if you have any questions. Thank you. The laptop. The first one on MD5. Yes. Hello. As we don't have so much time, or as I don't have so much time, I didn't. I let's. Hello. Good. I didn't produce any fancy slides or stuff. I just use a web browser and myself, and I hope it's enough. What I'd like to do is uh, to introduce you to MD5 Cracker. It's uh, actually it's it's a set of tools to 
to reveal the strings out of MD5 hashed, well, out of an MD5 hash. You know, it happens, well, more or less often that you, that you just browse the web, you know, and then I uh, click around and see some weird stuff about database, and then you play around with the parameter, and I uh, get something weird, which looks like an MD5, an MD5 hashed string. And what I do then is I go to md5.cryptobitch.de and I enter the string, the MD5 hashed string. No, the MD5 hash. I click this button and I hope it works. It doesn't, but I have prepared stuff. No, I didn't. All right, let's assume it's four. So. <laughs> what this is, this is basically a, a website which has indexed uh, lots of uh, clear text to MD5 hashes. It's, it's rather simple, it's just 200 lines of code, which I wrote with a colleague of mine, which sits over here as well. And what this site makes so special is that it's one of the biggest. It has around 175 yeah, hashes, which is yeah, the biggest, I think. It, uh, it is open source. You can get it uh, from Freshmeet and check it out from SVN. SVN. And I'd like you to run such a site because it's rather simple. It's a CGI script. It looks basically as, well, you can uh, make it like this. Uh, and yeah, it's simple. It's simple to set up. And it has support for cross-site, cross cross-site, how to, how to help. You can connect it, interconnect it between domains. You see it's another domain. So, well, set it up, call me up, and I'll we'll make a network and make Google index those strings. With that, we can use Google to reveal those hashes. I prepared one of those there. So you just enter your MD5 hash there, and it shows up in Google, on Google. <laughs> How does it work? Basically like this. If you enter this uh, URL, you'll get such an interface. And if you follow a link, you'll get new hashes with new, yeah, new text with new hashes. If you follow a link, you get new ones. You get some special hashes as well, a hash of a hash, and, well, some random hashes. As I said, that's uh, open source, which basically means we, have, we, we don't have any time or <laughs> Uh, we don't have the energy and power to, to, to build it, so we'd like you to contribute. And we have lots of problems um, because we thought, well, design it well and program it well. Uh, everyone could do that. Let's make it really bad. And we did it the worst way. It's implemented as CGI, as you might see. So it's rather slow. It has a MySQL backend, which might not be the, the best choice as well. The tables are not properly designed, so there's uh, lots of stuff to do for you. Mm, well, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, as you can see, we need more servers. I have 158% of CPU load of 100. And yeah, 60, 16 gigabytes of data, which is pretty much. So yeah, just um, call, call us up, show up, contribute. That's it. Mach mal, nimm mal deinen Laptop. Okay, the next talk will be by Rainer about the analyst blog. Yeah, Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, I'm Rainer. Um, I just want to give a short notice about something. Uh, I don't know who of you... Uh, saw this talk from um, Anne about her experience about being super, uh, super veiled all the time because her husband is suspected of being a bad, badass terrorist, uh, which is not true. Um, but she, so she blogs about her experience um, and she does not have the nerves, although she speaks uh, really good English, she doesn't have the nerve to blog everything in German and English, but she wants to know a lot of people uh, she wants to let 
um, a lot of people know about this. So um, some ideas were about translating this blog, and that's just um, what someone did so far. It's uh, hosted here on the CCC websites. It's a blog with um, uh, with links to the blog entries of her, which are still not translated. This one here you see, it's already translated. And so just uh, if you find some free minutes and you speak German and English, just grab one, translate it, put the link here, and that's it. And possibly within the next week, um, her blog will be translated in English for everyone to read in English how it is if you are celebrating with your husband and your kid and suddenly 16 full-armed policemen raid your flat. Okay, this is it. Okay, thanks. So we have uh, two more talks. And that's uh, super, super bad from. <laughs> you need any slides? Okay. Thank you. Hello, audience. I'm Georg Schütz, I'm from supersurveillancespectacle.com, which uh, we are the parents of Super Bertram. So our goal is to make you famous using surveillance technology in the end. So we set up cameras in public spaces, have mobile ones, have fixed ones, and they are not like normally streaming to a... a so we are not making a closed circuit television, it's common CCTV where the pictures are just avail available by uh, some inspectors or someone. We are making uh, public uh, television, or we are making everything public in the end. So if you see Super Bertram here, uh, his main functions are not working right now. He's out of, out of battery, unfortunately. But normally he's powered with 12 volt and has a lot of high tech inside. So, uh, main thing is he has two, mo two movable webcams built in here. And if you go to his website, you can move them left, right, up, down. And he also had, had unfortunately, he has not right now an uh, integrated mobile phone number, so you can call him. So you can go to his website, look out of his eyes, and call him to interact with the, uh, with the scenery. Huh? Oh, the, the number, but actually it's, it's an Austrian mobile phone number. It is plus four three six nine nine one one two eight three five five six. But as I said, not the number is on the page, yeah? Yeah. So actually we want to change this feature to some kind of shout box where you have a chat beyond the, uh, beyond the, the live view. Here, this is the live view. Unfortunately, it's offline right now. Normally, you see the eyes. You click in two, and they move. Uh, yeah, I'm traveling around with him. Unfortunately, he always needs a host who is making him really mobile. Uh, GPS is also in under construction right now. Normally, he's hosted at, at, at the boot lab in Tacheles right now, as long as, he's, as he is in Berlin. And yeah, another and now comes the, the, the one thing is the live streaming stuff, and the other thing is his brain. His brain is flicker. So we see here the last pictures which he took. Um, <laughs> it's a, I think it's a Scheible t shirt, the back of a Scheible t shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's about him. Uh, there's also a Christmas tree at the boot lab right now with, with four CCTV, uh, not CC, with four surveillance cameras. Here you see the last days. So it's partly it's used motion detection, partly a uh, predefined time interval. A lot of Schaubles. <laughs> By now we have 38,000. Uh, 448 photos on Flickr. 
So I would say it's, it's a little bit of, about uh, transparency and data flooding, data, data flood, data flooding for sure. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. And the last lightning talk is about uh, spanning tree analyzer. Here, you forget your paper. And anyone forgot forgot the, that? Personal adapter? No. So my name is Christian Müller, and I want to uh, show you my uh, spanning tree simulator and uh, visual visualization tool. Um, I'm from Berlin, from the TFH Berlin. It's a technical university of applied science here. And um, I programmed the uh, software for my diploma thesis, which is on industrial ethernet. And you must know the industry is starting to use ethernet and their um, um, using it on the top level so to monitor uh, the systems and to upgrade um, the machines so it's not that critical as you may think if, uh, if you hear about Ethernet in industry. So um, one thing they, they like to do is they, they are using the ring structures and um, they, they've used the uh, token ring uh, networks before and um, the, when I use Ethernet and, and ring structures they have one a major um, new feature, which is um, when you have a ring and you want to reach a node on the opposite side of the ring, you always have two ways to go. So um, if the ring is broken somewhere, you can always still reach the other end. But there's also a problem with rings in Ethernet. Um, you may know when you, have, um, when, you, when you connect switches in a ring or you just connect one switch and two parts of one switch, um, you, you get the broadcast storms, so that means the, the broadcast packages will be, will be looping in your net, and in some configurations they will even multiply, and that's something you want to prevent. So what can you do? There's the spanning tree protocol, and uh, who in this room does know, kind of know how, how spanning tree is working? Okay, so that's a lot. But uh, maybe if you see a visualization of it, and then, then and the others also will see how it's working. So I can just show, um, show the software. Moment. OK, I have to start it up. It's a Python tool. And it has two windows. One is um, a VX widgets uh, window. Uh, VX Python window, and the other one is the uh, 3D window. And here you can see your network, and you can configure configure your network with the um, with the buttons window here, and just like add switches, or connect switches, or just close the ring as you may need if you want the ring structure. And as STP is not on, only for ring structures, but for normal networks, you can also um, just uh, create any kind of network here, like that one. So when I start a simulation, you will see um, the switches getting different colors. Um, you must know every switch is uh, simulating the spanning tree protocol. So there's an uh, STP object behind it. And um, it's, it's um, simulating the, the state machine in real time. So um, the switches 
start um, to change the color depending on, on their state and uh, the switches are turning red, that means they think they are root switch of the STP network. And also the ports are changing colors and um, just um, one thing, if they, if they are turning red, that means they are blocked. So I can, oops, oh, double connection. Oh, maybe we'll find a bug now. But I start simulation. And um, after some time, we get, um, we get the root switch here. And um, we also see there are still packages uh, uh, turning from switch to switch here. We see the TX and the RX uh, lights blinking. And we also see that there are some ports blocked. This is uh, that one here to uh, prevent that loop from happening. And also the other one to prevent the other loop. And we also have the upper loop here prevented from happening. So, so actually the, the red port means that it's blocking normal traffic. So there's no, hopefully there's no uh, loop in that network. Okay, so that's a um, feature. And, and uh, since it's a vPython uh, window here, I can also rotate it and uh, zoom in and stuff. And I can also show you the log file of this simulation. Which is the last one. And you see um, the switches with their MAC addresses um, changing, changing their states and also the ports of the switches are changing their states. And so in the beginning, you see they all sync their root mode and after receiving some SDP packets, they're starting to get, uh, to find out they're not actually root. And the log is not complete, I think, here. So let's have a look at an older log. Well, because I just closed the windows in the wrong, uh, I don't know. Let's have a look at this one. So um, same configuration, I think. So one thing I wanted to show you here is um, after, after the, we have uh, the one root switch, there's, um, there's uh, the, finish, uh, the finishing, uh, the last change here, and which means that after that, no other change happened, and after that, our network is stable. And this is one thing you want to know, because when you uh, build dead networks, um, you want to, want to know how fast will it recover in, in any fault uh, situation. So... Uh, when you simulate that uh, multiple times, you get the worst case situation because it's not only uh, simulating in real time, but it's also a random offset to get it more realistic. So you can play, uh, play around with the random offset and then you can uh, find out what's the worst case for your network. And um, that's what it's all about here. Okay, so um, this is the tool. And uh, it's a GPL tool. You can download it from my homepage, and it's a Python tool, so you can easily uh, extend it. It's a kind of modular, and um, I got some ideas what, what we could do. I mean, you could uh, implement other protocols, like RSTP or even upper layer protocols. And you can also um, uh, take the visual part and visualize uh, normal networks, or just use SNMP and, or stuff and, and visualize normal uh, normal situations. So uh, if you want to use that, you can just uh, contact me. And you can also download my diploma thesis, which, uh, which is in German. OK, thank you. OK, thanks. Uh, is there anyone who I forgot for talk? Anyone wants to give a talk, another talk? No? OK, then thanks for listening to all the lightning talks. And, well, have a nice Congress. <laughs> <laughs>